Welcome to our live stream today. I'm David Kessler. I'm going to give folks who want to tune in live a moment to find their way on. Many of you will be watching it in the replay. No matter when you're here, I'm glad you're here. We're going to be talking just for a few moments today about unattended grief. And grief is in the air, it's in the news, and I know it's an important part of your work. So I wanted to make sure we come on. And one of the things that I'm really grateful to for PESI and the Psychotherapy Networker is a lot of organizations don't give grief. Really, it's due. And both the Networker and PESI truly understand that grief is a part of life. It's a part of healing, it's a part of education, and we know it's a part of your work. So I'm grateful for them to do this. And uh, I wanna just dive in and begin talking a bit about unattended grief. And, you know, first of all, we often don't name a lot of feelings as grief. And in the past few years, I know your clients and all of us have dealt with so many losses that have come up in so many different ways. And we often don't even name them all as losses. And I always think of grief as the death of something. You know, a breakup is the death of a relationship. A divorce is the death of a marriage. A job loss is the death of that paycheck with those people in that place. And in these past few years, there's been death, there's been job loss, there's been loss of safety, there's been loss of agreements, there's been loss of freedom, health, events, our normal life. You know, our life is so different now than it was two and a half, three years ago. Loss of milestones, loss of rituals, loss of transitions between meetings and life. So, so many different unnamed losses. And it really starts with beginning to recognize some of those losses. So that's what we're going to talk about today, is really attending some of those losses. And I'm David Kessler. I'm a grief expert. I got into this field when my mother died when I was 13. I think that's the moment it chose me. I know sometimes our work chooses us. So my mother was dying. At the same time, there was a uh, mass shooting at the hotel across the street that went on for 13 hours. It was one of the first shootings in the US. And I work with people to witness their grief, attend their grief, really because I had to learn to witness and attend to my own grief. And after decades of doing this work and writing books with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Louise Hay, then out of the blue, I was brutally broadsided by the death of my younger son, David. So I have had to deal with this topic professionally and personally. And I have learned so much at the feet of people. And I'm really happy to pass that information on to help us all find healing in our own way. So as we talk about unattended grief, I always remind people that all grief does not have trauma but all trauma has grief. And unattended grief seeps into our relationship. It seeps into our work. We begin to live from the grief, live from our wounds. So to talk about unattended grief, we have to talk about what attending grief looks like. It was interesting to think about what does attending grief look like? It means someone, the client, our loved ones, our friends and family feel heard, they feel seen, they feel witnessed, they feel validated, validated. And being our authentic self is literally the hardest thing we do in our life. So much of your work is helping your clients find their authentic self. The second hardest thing to do is to see someone else, to fully see them without ourselves getting in the way. And that's what makes you so good at your job. I have an online grief group called Tender Hearts. And one day a week, we have what's called a check-in 
and we check in on our feelings and how we're feeling, you would think it would be the easiest question to answer, and yet it's not. So many times when I ask people, how are you feeling today, right now? They will tell me about the story of what happened in their grief. Sometimes I even see them begin to re-traumatize themselves and we have to pause the story. Other times they'll tell me their to-do list that they completed, or they'll tell me what's in front of them that they have to do. And just asking someone to find their actual feelings in the moment is really hard. We, we naturally go into the story. And one of the things I've learned from that that's really fascinating when it comes to attending grief is so many people will share, I repeat the story over and over again, and I still don't feel heard. I don't know why I don't feel heard as I do get to tell the story. And what I've learned is that many times it's not the story that needs to be witnessed, but the feelings in the story that needs to be witnessed. So many times that's why it's so helpful to really talk about those feelings. So I think about, you know, as we're helping people, sometimes people want us to solve their problems. And one, I always remind people that's not actually our role. And two, sometimes in grief, people want to be fixed. And I remind them they're actually not broken. You know, grief is an organic experience that we have. Ultimately, I believe that grief is love. And so our starting point is to really acknowledge what they're going through and normalizing it. Of course, you're in pain when your loved one died. So when we talk about attending feelings, we really have to talk about this idea of being able to be with our emotions without judging them. Now, here's the surprising thing about that. When I say to people, are you judging your emotions? One of the things that comes up is they'll go, of course I'm not judging my emotions. Why would you think I'm judging my emotions? And I'll go, I, I understand, but let me tell you, one of the things you said is you wanted these feelings to be over. You don't understand why you're still sad. You don't think you should be angry. And I'll remind them in grief, anytime you think you should be in a different place than you are, you are not accepting your feelings. You are actually judging them. And judgment demands punishment. We punish others or we punish ourselves. So it's this idea of accepting the feelings. And there's so much in the news today about grief and how long grief should last. And it's such an important topic. And just learning about grief is so important. As you know, PESI is going to be having a two-day free grief summit. Like I said, I just so acknowledge them for really understanding that grief is part of life. And so as people are figuring out how to attend to their feelings and thinking these feelings should be gone by now, they have this aha moment that like, oh, if I'm thinking I should be further along in my grief, I'm actually not accepting my grief where it is in this moment. The other thing that happens so often is the feeling that people are in whatever it may be, pain, sadness, loneliness, jealousy, grief has a million colors, I always remind people, and a million feelings, we often project that into our future. I'm lonely now. I'm going to have 40 years of loneliness. I'm in pain now. This pain is never going to end. I remind people that no feeling is final. Our feelings are ever-changing. And attending your grief is actually attending your feelings. It's actually attending your feelings.
And one of the things is, you know, I'm a big believer that we only feel one feeling at a time. And so many times we stop the feeling we're having now because we think it might be the wrong feeling or we should have dealt with this or should be past this feeling. And we try to get to the next better feeling. But in grief, it's not a straight line. I worked with Kubla Ross on two books and adapting her stages of dying for stages of grief. And she was always the first one to say, those stages, they're not linear. There is no one right way to grieve. There is no one right model of grief. There's only our way to grieve. But many times we are measuring our grief, thinking it should be done. So for instance, I was on the other day with a woman who shared her husband had died and she was going to that same hospital to visit her husband's brother who was dying. And she said, all these feelings came up and I'm backtracking, I'm back to where I started. And it's interesting to notice how sometimes people in grief will label what they're going through is backtracking back to the beginning. All the work I've done is for naught. And I remind them, you're not supposed to go into a hospital that your loved one died in and see someone else you love dying in that hospital and not have an emotional reaction. It does not mean that your loved one, somehow what you're experiencing is abnormal, that those feelings are abnormal and that it's now been triggered by something else. So people also in your work you see in grief, they get worried if they open the door to their feelings of grief, it'll take over. I'm sure you've had so many people share, if I start crying, it will never end. I always tell people, I have been doing this for years and I've never seen someone who's crying didn't eventually end. It may have started again, but it did end. The same way people have this feeling of anger, right? This anger, and by the way, I use the words uh, feeling and emotions interchangeably. I noticed someone mentioned that. So to think about this feeling of, if I let that anger out, it's never going to end. And the truth is, once it gets released, you will actually go to the next feeling. One of the negative byproducts of the self-help movement is that, that feeling of judgment, like I'm sad, I shouldn't be sad, I'm angry, I shouldn't be angry, and our feelings get put on the shelf half felt. So we wanna feel them fully. That's part of the work is to help our clients feel their feelings fully. And as I mentioned so many times, we think our feelings are wrong in grief. We think we should be done with our feelings sooner. And one of the things I do that I think would be interesting, and I know many of you do this naturally, is when someone has issues with feeling their sadness, feeling their anger, I'll ask them, how was sadness modeled for you? What were you taught about sadness? You know, was it uh, crying is weak? Was it that you shouldn't cry, you should be strong? Uh, what, you know, what were you taught as a child about your anger? Uh, it's not ladylike to be angry, I've heard so many different things. One of the things that's really an interesting thing to do is to really look at how we were taught to grieve. What, what do we think about loss? How was it modeled for us? You know, a lot of times, we accept the way grief was modeled for us without choosing it ourselves. Here's what I mean by that. And I'll say this to people. Most people can remember that moment growing up, like someone asked you when you're 10, 12, 14, you know, are you Democrat or Republican? And we naturally say whatever our parents are. Then there comes a point we become adults and we go, all right, let me examine this world and see, am I truly a Democrat or a Republican? And we make the choice for ourselves. The same is true about grief. Grief was modeled for us. Okay, I can take that on 
and I can decide how I want to grieve. Maybe I believe crying isn't a sign of weakness. Maybe I believe anger, you know, when released appropriately, isn't a problem and it's a natural emotion. And I always tell people that anger is pain's bodyguard. So these are important things for us to have discussions about. And uh, as I mentioned, I think it's getting put in the chat. Pessy is going to be having an amazing grief summit coming up with myself and Megan Devine. Um, so many wonderful people are going to be there. And so it's really an, an, an interesting um, two days and it's completely free. So I hope you'll check that out. The other thing we do to not attend grief is to bright side ourselves, use toxic, toxic positivity to let other people feel like and tell us we should be over our grief or look on the bright side or find the gratitude. And we do that to ourselves sometimes. You know, it's easy for a client to come in and to really think they had one session with you where they cried about the death and that was their grief work. And it's for us to remind them how grief is a longer process than we may think. And it does weave our way through our whole lives. And it does weave our ways into our relationship. I always say when people ask what's the goal of grief work, it's to eventually remember with more love than pain, but in our own way and in our own time. And I was talking to someone, I have a new podcast that's going to be coming out. And as I was talking to them, they were talking about how their parent had died when they were a child. And when I asked about their life now, they said they weren't, they had too much fear around marrying or having children. And we talked about how grief really made their decisions in so many ways to not have relationships. So that's a link that you as a therapist can help or mental health professional can help make for clients that grief and attending it is so important, not just for that moment when it happens, but to really sort out losses and attachments. And this comes up a lot in my grief educator program because it's important to know that unattended grief doesn't always come up as clear as we think, that it's not just about that initial acute phase when we're in the deep pain. And it's not as simple as missing that person. It has so many other tentacles that goes into our life. And I think about this idea that attending grief is really attending our feelings. And not attending to our grief is not attending to our feelings. And I want you to know the difference you make because grief is passed down through generations. And you are not only impacting that client in front of you, you are impacting other generations to come, their friends and their family. And it's so, so, so important that you understand so many times your clients may not have it in the midst of their pain to thank you for the work that you do. And that's why I think it's so important that people like me and Pessy and Psychotherapy Networker really help you understand how grateful I, they are, and the world is for your work. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll continue to uh, learn a little bit more about uh, grief and unattended grief. And as I mentioned, the Grief Summit is coming up. And we're going to have more information about the whole um, controversy on prolonged grief. So a lot more coming. Thank you so much for being here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thanks.